Hi, I'm Josh Bassiches, Director and CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum. Welcome to this special online presentation of our signature lecture series, Rom Speaks. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. From fascinating viewpoints to thought-provoking insights, Rom Speaks presents the brightest minds and most compelling voices on ideas that matter across art, culture, and nature. Please enjoy this essential new addition to our Rom at Home digital programming. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the museum for more programs like this when it is safe to do so. We're going to have fun tonight. I thought I would just kind of take you through what it's like to work for National Geographic. Um, I've been with them for a long time now as a freelancer. We're all freelancers. There's not really any staff photographers left. Um, and I can tell you this, that it's no picnic. People say it's got to be a lot of fun. Well, I don't know. I mean, the number one question I get asked uh, whenever I speak someplace is, have you ever come close to getting killed on assignment? That's all pe people want to know. One lady asked me if I ever had been killed on assignment yet. <laughs> Not yet, but you know, we're asking for it, aren't we? When, we? when we pop a flash off in a bison's face, what's he gonna do? He's gonna pin you underneath the feed truck for an hour. <laughs> While you're down there, you may as well take some more pictures, I guess. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Uh, the truth is, really, it's the little stuff that I worry about, the little stuff. I've had a flesh-eating parasite from the bite of a sand fly in Bolivia that required a pick line into the top chamber of my heart for a month. That was no fun. Um, I've had uh, gotten, gotten exposed to the Marburg virus, had to be in quarantine for a month. You know, I was supposed to take my temperature twice a day, and I was started to show a fever. I was supposed to drive by myself to a hospital, and they have a negative air pressure bubble inside a negative air pressure room, and my odds would have been 50-50. Of course, I checked my temperature 100 times a day and uh, never got it. But, you know, we're, we're asking for it, aren't we, when we do pictures like this. This is, uh, this is on assignment in Alaska. I hadn't made a good picture in three days. And I was desperate, so I took off my shoes and socks just to show the insect load up there. Um, it ran big in the magazine, and one lady sent me a coupon for a free pedicure, which was very nice. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, the other question I get all the time is, how do you get a job with National Geographic? Well, for me, I grew up in Nebraska. I went to the University of Nebraska, where the N stands for knowledge. That's correct. <laughs> and... Um, Took pictures of the kind of things that I thought were interesting or weird. Uh, these are young cows watching a pasture fire burn. Uh, guy covered with bees. He had some pheromone he'd invented. Uh, the, the Chickendale dancers at the Chicken Festival in Wayne, Nebraska. These are, uh, they're supposed to be like the Chippendales, but they drink a lot more beer. And that's why, that's why they're in such terrible physical shape. Um, uh, I just took pictures all around me and got a job with a local newspaper and then on to another newspaper. And, you know, I just took all the, wa all the way along, I just took the kind of pictures I thought were weird or different or funny. Could be a cowboy roping a cat. Could be um, the guy dusting the stuffed sheep in the back of the Cabela's sporting goods store. Um, it could be a lady walking her Dalmatian in her Dalmatian skin coat. Fake Dalmatian skin coat, I should say. Um, bad dogs make really good pictures, it turns out. Some dogs are a little worse than others, I guess. So of all the pictures you're going to see tonight, this is the only one that's kind of pretend. This is my dog, Prairie. I named her Prairie Dog because the state of Nebraska had officially declared Prairie Dogs as a pest. And I wanted the biggest one in the state because Prairie Dogs are the basis of the prairie ecosystem. They are not pests. Um, she would do anything for a milk bone, a little treat. So I would loop a little fishing line underneath her, her top lip and lift it up, take a picture and pay her off. So that's how that was done. That's the only one. Um, when I started with Geographic so many years ago, I guess it's been 28 years ago now, I did a lot more stories with people in them. Now it's just photo arc all the time. But for my people stories, you know, I, um, I wanted to do a, a piece on America's State Fairs. I thought that would be fun. They pay all your expenses. You can eat all the corn dogs you can hold. So uh, I did, I don't know, eight State Fairs in eight weeks or nine weeks. This is the one I started at. That's the Midway Barker. 
He is singing all of me, why not take all of me? Um, and he's actually six foot four and standing up. Uh, it's a mirror illusion. You can't tell until you're right in front of him. Uh, then from there I went to the Iowa State Fair. Iowa has a lot of contests. Like they had the world's largest corn dog chomp. And then they have a, a very creepy mother-daughter look-alike contest <laughs> that, that afternoon. And then in the evening, they always have a really weird act of some sort, like entertainment. And so that year it was the hypnotist act, which was... The real thing, those people are out. They're not plants, they're out. From there, I drove all night to get to the Indiana State Fair because they had a big, big, big event, the cockroach tractor pull. I couldn't miss it. <laughs> Got there for that. Um, my favorite thing, though, was this ride, the slingshot ride at the Minneapolis, or the Minnesota State Fair in Minneapolis. This is a cage that's on cables, like springs, and they shoot people up 200 feet in the air in like two seconds or three seconds. And um, the ride owner, I put a radio-controlled camera inside so I could fire it from the ground. The ride owner was such a good businessman, he put a live microphone in that cage and he would broadcast on speakers all around the base the filth and the obscenities these people would scream. <laughs> and what did it do? He'd double the length of the line and double the price. Brilliant guy. Yeah, I've been around so long now that I'm having a chance to revisit things that I, that I photographed before. The... Um, Geographic, a couple years ago, did an entire story, or an entire issue on food. And they remembered that I photographed these twin farm boys in um, some little town called Oxford, Nebraska, 25 years earlier. And they said, go back and see them and photograph them today. We want to see, a, you know. And I said, they're both dead and in the ground. Look at how they eat. There's no way. <laughs> they said, now just go back, see if you can find them. So, you know, I went back. There they were. They were sitting right there. <laughs> 25 years later, turns out, <laughs> turns out grease is a really good preservative. <laughs> Since we're a nice, intimate crowd, and I learned today from my loyal assistant, Brian Hayhoe. Brian, are you here today? Yes. Brian? Oh, I must have broken his spirit. <laughs> oh, there he is. Thanks for coming, Brian. Uh, I learned today that you guys, uh, you guys cherish family, and you, uh, you would enjoy some American humor tonight. So... Here we go. I thought I would introduce you to my family. <laughs> First, my wife, Kathy, long-suffering. Next, grandmother in nursing home on her 90th birthday. <laughs> Next, daughter Ellen, not so happy with me. <laughs> daughter Ellen. She, uh, she taught me the beauty of the camera as a weapon. <laughs> when she would throw a fit, I would break out the camera, and she hated being humiliated like that, so she'd just shape right up. That's great. It didn't work so well for my youngest, Spencer. He was a professional fit thrower. He, uh, he, in his younger days, you know, he, uh, he would throw a fit at home. It's just not a problem, you know. Give him a challenge. He really wanted to take his show out on the road and go into full vapor lock in a restaurant. <laughs> just scream at the top of his lungs into that filthy floor under the table. Uh, maybe we'd be on vacation at the Grand Canyon. That's a great place to ruin, to ruin a week. Sure. Could be Easter Sunday, religious holidays, those aren't off limits. So we should talk about conservation. But I guess one of the reasons I show the, all those other pictures, besides getting laughs, is the fact that we really do need to engage people and entertain. We better do it. If we want to save what's left of nature, you better make it interesting. You better make it entertaining. And so because I have this background in human photography, it made the transition fine for me going into nature photography or conservation photography, I call it. We want pictures to have a message. We want them to get hooked. For a story on grizzly bears in North America, I was given eight weeks of assignment time, and I spent one full week of that assignment time, what, being treed by a bear? You think that's real? No, obviously not. But although those are my boots, and you notice the tops of the boots are a little wet. Don't ask why they're wet. <coughs> I spent my first full week out of eight weeks with trained bears in California knowing that the bears in the wild wouldn't necessarily subscribe to National Geographic or care to have their picture taken. I wanted to make sure I had good pictures of bears that were interesting, compelling, engaging, whatever you want to call them, to get people into it. Like this is a bear that's having donut holes thrown in his mouth by a trainer uh, off to the side. There's a little piece of yellow yarn on the ground that's hard to see. He won't cross that. He thinks it's a hot wire. Bears are extremely intelligent. They're not pets. But they're very intelligent, and they're all trained to do basically the same few things. Either look real cute by waving, or fake maul, 
or fake growl, roar. The roar is always dubbed in later. All these bears opening their mouths, they're not making a sound. Once in a while, they're whimper because they're not getting enough food. So why would I spend one week? Well, because seriously, to get good enough pictures to publish in National Geographic, what we call winning, if it gets into print, it's tough. You can't just take a long lens and take a picture of a bear standing in a meadow. It's got to be a lot more action-packed than that. It's got to be a bear grabbing a salmon in midair at Brooks Falls. And it's not enough just to shoot one picture when you've gone all the way from Nebraska to Alaska. You better show how it's done. The world is filling up, isn't it? We all know the world's filling up. Look at this. This is the scene if you step back. It's 30 to 40,000 photographers a year shooting over a million pictures of those same eight or nine bears that catch fish in midair. Most of them bob for salmon at the base of the waterfalls. That's pressure. That's a lot of pressure. But never a problem. Bears are smart. They know they're going to get their butts kicked if they attack somebody up there. And there's, what, one or two grizzly kills a year in North America, the whole continent, with millions of people hiking around. So that's not the problem. The problem is us, right? As we spread out, our garbage goes with us. Bears love the, all the food we throw away and the interesting smells. And a fed bear is a dead bear. This is up at uh, Dead Horse, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, where the oil drilling is. I bet you I'm going way too fast. I should slow down. Um, those bears all get shot and sold as rugs at the state of, La state of Alaska surplus sale. So it's a little bit of a formula, you'll see. We shoot a few pictures that are weird, different, funny, interesting. Try to get people into the story so that we can teach something, so that we can just have a teachable moment or two. We call those issue pictures. They're not pretty. They're ugly sometimes. But we really do. All these other pictures, to me, are a vehicle to deliver to the public a picture that moves the needle of conservation. That's what it's about. A story on uh, koalas in northern Australia. They're in trouble. Southern koalas are doing better. Uh, but northern Australia, man, they're in trouble. So we shoot the weird pictures first. This was a three-week assignment. Three weeks, right? We shoot the cute, the cuddly. Oh, isn't that cute? But anybody that deals with, with wildlife, right, like Maria from Toronto, she knows this isn't a good scene. This is a real bad scene. Well, why is that? Why do these human mothers have babies? Well, because mom's dead. Mom tried to get down out of a tree and she, from the golf course. It's the last place she can live. And she tried crossing the road and she gets hit by a car or more likely bitten by dogs. They have no defense against dogs. At one wildlife rehab center, this is not a fun picture to look at, but I knew before I left, the people, the nurses at this rehab center were so mad the government of Australia had not declared the northern koala imperiled and in need of protection, especially of its habitat, they saved for me in a freezer one week's worth of koalas all killed by dogs, including that mom and baby in the lower left. So I spread them out on a tarp, tears in my eyes, of course, when I stopped to think about what I was photographing, and this picture went all over the world, as intended. And uh, what do you know? The government of Australia decided to list the northern koala as imperiled and give them protection about a month or two later. And lots of groups have been working on it, but I was happy to help put another nail in that coffin lid. The trouble is that most environmental things anymore are not so clear-cut. Pretty easy to understand. Koalas need trees, right? What about wolves? What do you think about wolves? This is tough. I like using wolves because they're enigmatic. They're very mysterious. They're kind of ghosty, aren't they? Are they bloodthirsty killers? Most of us live in cities anymore. We're never going to see a wolf unless we go to a zoo. Are they bloodthirsty killers? Are they fuzzy pets? No, they're neither. And this is the issue. This is the issue of our time. At a time when we are drowning in information, it is very easy to go onto the Internet or choose your television channel and echo chamber it. Reinforce the views you already have. No matter how bad those views are or how informed those are, just circulate them. Swirl around, swirl around. Well, we want to know what to believe. We ask others to tell us all the time, especially now. Are wolves good or bad? We want to know that. Every television show you watch, every reality show, they cue you with music. What to think when a person walks in the room. Sinister music? That must be a bad person. We'll hate him or her. Happy-go-lucky music, this must be a nice, fun person who's kind of a clown. We'll like that person. Wolves, nature, they don't give you that opportunity. They don't come with music telling you what to think. The key is to study, Morgan, study. Study, learn for yourself, and form your own stinking opinions, people. Do not let anybody tell you what to think. 
Either way, get an opinion on your own. And if you think that you know everything and for sure you're right, I guarantee you, you're wrong. Because only a fool doesn't change their minds if they get information to the contrary of what they've already learned. So these are the things that I learned when I was out running around all over the world for 17 years for National Geographic. The last story I did before I had a life-altering event was that story where my, my, my feet were bitten up by mosquitoes. And then it all kind of all stopped because my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was in Cactovic, Alaska, and she... Uh, so I ought to come home, and, and I finished that. You know, I left right then, and, uh, and um, she would felt a tumor in her right breast, and she started in on chemo, radiation, and I was home for, for a year all of a sudden trying to be a dad. We had three kids at home. The, younger, the youngest was the two-year-old fit thrower. I didn't know whether we were going to lose her, lose our house, because I wasn't able to shoot anymore. I was a day-rate guy. A day-rate guy shoots for so many hundred dollars a day. If you're not in the field shooting, you don't get paid. I didn't know anything. Didn't know what I was going to do. I knew that I'd never been grounded. I'd never been home in all those years. I was gone three-fourths of the year. But all of a sudden, everything just stopped. <sighs> and that was okay. It was all right. I mean, I had a chance to think. And it's been, it's been almost 13 years, 12 years now. Kathy's fine. She made it through, which is excellent. And here we are today. Thank you. And um, it taught me the shortness of life, and it taught me to, to rededicate myself to trying to do something that will move the needle in a big way. I... Uh, I thought about the work of John James Audubon, who's my hero. He's the ultimate wildlife storyteller to me. He's the first one to really paint birds doing the things they do rather than just as sideways pictures like I shoot for the photo arc, to be honest with you. He actually showed them doing things. And he described these birds in a way that, that we, would, we would have lost all time. These are all extinct now. Were it not for him, he didn't just paint them, but he described them. He's a great naturalist. And he gave his full measure of devotion to this one thing, his entire life, the birds of North America. And he went on to do the mammals, and his son finished it for him. I think that, that's awesome. He dedicated, he gave everything to that, including Martha the passenger pigeon. The, this is the last passenger pigeon, a bird that numbered in the billions, and we market hunted them down to that bird who died in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. Couldn't believe that as a kid, still can't. I thought of George Catlin, who was a famous Native American painter. He didn't just paint people portraits, like in their native clothing. He painted their ways of life because he could see that European settlement was going to clean the clock of their culture and really alter it severely. Can you imagine? These are the things that he saw. But again, here's a guy who gave his entire adult life to this one thing, 35, 40 years. And then Edward Curtis came along at the dawn of the photographic era. He got a loan from J.P. Morgan, basically a grant, 75 grand, which was a lot of money. And he, could, he hired linguists. He hired interpreters. He hired guides, trackers. He hired early filmmakers and lots of glass plate negatives and went around and documented 88 tribes in the American West and created this body of work at the very last minute these people knew the old ways, or at least their parents and grandparents did. At the very last minute, was able to photograph tradition that would have been lost forever. So I thought, that's for me. Now, what to do about it? One thing, specialize in one thing. Focus. Focus. I'm a pretty focused guy. So I tried this. On the days when Kathy felt better, I would put a radio-controlled camera, similar to the one I photographed on the slingshot ride in Minnesota, the state fair, and I put it out next to plants where I could see birds using the habitat that they liked, like American goldfish, like thistles and weedy acreages. Bluebirds are a, are a bird of short grass and gardens. I thought, I'm going to try to show these birds in the correct habitat, lit beautifully, just really show them in their environment. But each of these pictures took more than 40 hours to do with radio-controlled cameras at feeders and nest sites, looking through a spotting scope. And that's no way to change the world. And so eventually this photo arc idea came to be. On the assignments that I started to take again, short ones, the moment Kathy said, I'm okay, go, I started to take black and white backgrounds with me. And I started to do portraits wherever I could, however I could. If an animal's at a meat market in Equatorial Guinea and going to be made into stew that night, 
we br bring black velvet along and make him immortal. I started in earnest then, full-time, with a story on amphibian decline. These are in the high Sierras of California. They're all killed by a thing called chytrid fungus, which is sweeping the world. Nobody really knows how it got going. But amphibians are in serious dec decline already. They were from habitat loss, pollution. They take in toxins through their skin. They can't take climate change at all. Remember, climate change means some parts of the world are going to get colder. Some parts are going to get hotter. Some will get wetter. Some will get drier. Amphibians really do need a stable environment. They need a moist environment that's not too cold, not too hot, because they can't change quickly like we can. They just can't. So off we went. Went down to Ecuador to a breeding lab for some of the world's rarest animals. And time and time again, the biologists that ran the facility would bring me an aquatic passenger pigeon, I guess you could say. He brought this out. He said, nine left. We don't know how to get it to breed. We're pretty sure that they're almost out of time. Nine left. Five left. Three left. He kept saying, get its picture, get its picture. Because when we put these in alcohol, the color all drains away. They'll just turn to the color of a manila envelope. Just these two left. That's it. That's it. And this one. The very last Rab's fringed limb tree frog. This is an animal, the very last one from Panama, a victim of the fungus. This is at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. I did a video of him and I show him everywhere I go. They call him Tuffy because he outlived all life expectancies. He's pretty tough. But he passed away last year. And when he passed away, that was it. Why should we care? that a brown, kind of slimy animal has gone away. It's hard for me to articulate this, especially in a crowd that's constantly consumed with Kim Kardashian's rear end and who won the basketball game. How do you communicate the epic nature of extinction and the fact that this has gone away in the 11 or 12 years I've been doing the photo arc, this has gone extinct. And this, and this. Little things to be sure, but all of these it's not just the little stuff, mind you. At this zoo, uh, Suzhou Zoo in China, twice a year they drain this muddy pond to reveal the last two Yangtze giant soft-shell turtles. They're trying to do artificial insemination on them. A team from around the world goes there. They put these animals to sleep, and they're trying to do artificial insemination. It's never been tried on a soft-shell turtle. These animals are really, really old. This is a Hail Mary pass. It's very late in the game. The female was saved from a meat market as an adult in 1932. And she's the younger of the two of them. Boy, that's late in the game, isn't it? Or the northern white rhino. This is an old girl named Nibire at the Diver Kalave Zoo in the Czech Republic. They had me in. We were doing a PBS TV show called Rare, which aired last summer. She was a sweetheart. We photographed her for probably a half hour. She went, laid down and went to sleep at the end. And she was full of fluid-filled cysts. I remember the comms guy, the communications guy, said, I'm so glad you're here because when one of those cysts bursts, she will die. And she did. Ten days later, and now the world has three, all in one pen in Kenya, too old to breed most likely. So this is what we're really up against. This graph says it all. And this is from 2011. This is the mammal biomass that still exists. All the mammals that still exist. In red are us, humans. In blue are the animals we eat. Chickens, pigs, goats, cows. And then in green, that little sliver. That's the wild mammals that still exist. That's pretty tough. And that's why I'm in a big race to get people to care. And if it takes this type of picture, so be it. People like the cute, the cuddly. They really like the anthropomorphic, the things that they can relate to. Doesn't that turtle look like he's smiling? Didn't that sloth? Doesn't that bear? Isn't this fox just like my kid when I say something he doesn't understand? Oh, this reminds me of motherhood. Whatever it takes to get people to connect, now's the time. Now's the time, right? So we do a lot of baby animals. Really what I want to do is I want to show them the tarantula we got yesterday at the Toronto Zoo. I want to show them that. I want to show them the shrimp we got at a place called Shrimp Fever yesterday. All, it's an aquarist store for nano aquarius, little bitty shrimp. The guy had like 30 species. I want to show them those. But I can't show them a steady diet of the things they don't care about. I got to bring them along easy. So I show them baby gorillas and baby rhinos and tar seers and crazy looking old black lemurs. 
animals that are fierce, right? Animals with huge ears, whatever it takes just to get people engaged. We're starting to do more video now. Or very odd things. These are oblong winged katydids at the Insectarium terium at the New Orleans Zoo, Audubon Zoo. These actually are colors that hatch out naturally. But if you hatch out in a color other than green, what happens? A bird eats you instantly. Well, they hatch enough thousands of eggs down there. They're able to get all these colors, every color of the rainbow. Those are actual live, living bugs, right? The thing about the photo arc is this. It's a great equalizer in a way, using black and white backgrounds. All animals are the same size. We all know about rhinos. We know about elephants. But have you ever heard of a sleeping Mount Graham red squirrel? Or an ocelot. The thing is, on these backgrounds, that polar bear, he's no more important or worthy than the pahrumpf poolfish that nearly went extinct. The cheetah, well, he's about as good as a bog turtle or an American bearing beetle. They're all interesting. They all have value. The photo arc, we love them all, including these ghost ants with translucent bodies. They put out some colored sugar water, and we watched as these ants absorbed that color. These things aren't even as big as a fleck of pepper. Babarusas, sifakas, snakes, whatever it is. The goal is to get every animal in human care around the world before I die. So I've been at it about 12 years now. Some of these animals are quite shy, by the way, when you try to take their picture. <laughs> We've got 75, 7,600 species, maybe 7,700 species out of the 15,000. So we're half done. Um, these mice were plotting their escape from my shooting tent. Most of the time, we work with animals that are obviously have been around people all their lives. This bird was helping me edit, believe it or not. So many of the animals are quite calm, quite calm, and the shoots don't last long. This, this is a fairly easy shoot, this one. This, I'm going to set this up for you. This is at a place that's raising greater prairie chickens as surrogates for when they bring in the critically endangered Atwater's prairie chickens. You'll see the bird in a second. These birds are so jacked up in the spring, the males, on testosterone. This, male, this lady's caretaking these birds. She's raised them from eggs. She's going to wave her hand, and this bird, this male, is going to come over and perform for her hand. All right, here we go. <laughs> off we take the picture home we use Photoshop to clean up the dirt the debris the poop we start off with these animals on black and black backgrounds but we use Photoshop to clean it up we're not gonna stop most of these animals are in a tent like this tent we're not gonna stop and remove that bird every time he poops and put him back in the shoots last I don't know two to five minutes and um, ducks poop every 60 to 90 seconds if they've been feeding on water so we're just going to clean it up in Photoshop. The goal is to get done quickly, minimize stress, and get on with it. So for big animals, how do we do it? Well, we just did the East Caucasian Tour. Is that how you pronounce it, Maria? At, at Toronto Zoo. Uh, Maria put a big black series of boards out so the animals just come in. They think they're having breakfast or lunch, and they are. This was a similar process. We used paint at a zoo in Oklahoma. Um, for a tiger, same way. This is at a, at a, a zoo in China. South China, South China tigers down to nothing in the wild, maybe a hundred or so captive. It took a year for the PBS people to get the zoo to agree to let me paint that space right there black. Once I do that, man, I'm golden. This is what it looks like to your eye. We crank up the shutter speed. The shoot just takes like 15 minutes, tops, you know. And there you go. That's what he looks like. So I wanted to mention something, too, as we look at these beautiful birds. Um, Something about zoos. You know, zoos have taken a lot of heat lately for that movie Blackfish and all that. That started these things going. People are talking about, why do we have zoos? Well, many of the species you're seeing would be extinct without zoos. They'd be gone, right? Zoos can't save everything, but what they can do is they can educate us. They can keep educating us, especially at a time when so many people now live in cities far more than live in the country. Zoos provide the only place people can get a real education as to what nature actually looks like. What do these animals sound like? 
What are they, what are, how big and vital do they appear to us? What do they smell like? Some cases of educational animals you can actually touch. When we lose that last connection that zoos and aquariums provide, and nature is just some quaint notion on a smartphone, forget it. Nobody's going to save anything. You're, you realize that most of us in the room with gray hair are really kind of the last generation that knows what it's like to play in a body of water near your home or to be able to play without worrying about anything, to go into the woods without your mother worrying that you've been abducted. This is a big time. This is the crossroads right now. This is it. So, man, if you want to support conservation, become a member of the Toronto Zoo. They're world class. And they breed critically endangered species. Become a member. It's that simple. Um, I wanted to talk about primates a little bit. They are really, really popular. We reach 100 million people now every time we post to National Geographic Instagram. 100 million people. That's amazing. And they want to see primates. They want to see things that look like us or give us those anthropomorphic feelings, right? Mother and child or just oddball things. Look at how different they are, I guess. Hey, well, let's talk about something positive for a change, okay? Let's talk about the fact that, that people that I meet almost every week, but certainly every month, I meet a lot of wildlife heroes. I meet people who are saving critically endangered species. I've met people in China and at zoo, the zoo in Atlanta who have helped save the giant panda. But just in, on this continent, the whooping crane, the California condor, the Mexican gray wolf, the black-footed ferret, this is photographed at your Toronto Zoo, and the Vancouver Island marmot named Herman, photographed at your Toronto Zoo right here. These are animals that were all at the very brink of extinction, fewer than two dozen each, and they've all been saved because a few people cared. That's the whole thing. That's why the photo arc exists, really. It's not just to build a big obituary of what we're throwing away. No. It's to get people to care in time, to fall in love. They can't fall in love if you've not met it. Fall in love in time to save these animals. That's the thing, right? That's it. Here are some other animals at your Toronto Zoo, right? Amazing in every way. I see new things every time I go there, right? The Shrike breeding program. This is the only predatory songbird in North America, the Shrike. And this bird, do you recognize this bird? This is a secretary bird. We put up black velvet at the end of a hallway one day last time I was here. Zoomed in on his face. And what do you know? It's the cover of this month's National Geographic. How about that? Wildlife heroes. These are the people that keep me going. People say, do you ever get bummed when you run across extinction or an animal? You know, nope. I don't. I get, I get mad, and I get inspired to want to tell more stories and get more people into the tent. We're going to lose species, but we don't have to lose as many as we think we might if the public doesn't learn about this and care. There's a guy named Mike Lubbock. He runs Sylvan Heights Waterfowl. That guy and one other guy saved the pink-eared duck from extinction. When he was a very young man, he collected eggs from a bird that was going away in the wild. He did that. He cares about waterfowl. This guy, Don Butler, and his wife, Ann, they run Pheasant Heaven in Clinton, North Carolina. In their aviaries on their farm, they have 18 different species of pheasants, nine critically endangered, including this one, which is extinct in the wild in Vietnam now. They had 11% of the world's population of this pheasant right there at their place. As I'm photographing these birds in his garage in this big tent that we have that keeps the birds calm once they're inside, he's looking at the back of my camera and he's saying, I'm so glad you're here, Joel. There are no good pictures of this bird alive. They're all pictures of him dead in the, in the manuals we look at for identification. There are no good pictures of this one, he said. There's no good pictures of this one. Or this one, and I'm thinking, wow, these things look like Las Vegas showgirls. <laughs> if there are no good pictures of these things, Surely there's no good pictures of anything else. Small brown things, sparrows, newts, toads, worms, anything. And that's the deal. There's lots of room for improvement in terms of public education. This is another hero. This guy is not a, he's not, he doesn't work at a zoo. He doesn't breed animals. He's just out there educating people to the dangers of coal fines. This is what happens when you wash coal and it escapes into the river or purposely put into the rivers in Kentucky and Tennessee. It smothers critically endangered mussels. He is a mycologist. He's do donated his, dedicated his entire life to saving mussels, which don't even have eyes. I tried to photograph the shell so it would look like faces, I guess. Tilo Nadler. Here's a guy that started the Endangered Primate Rescue Center in Cuc Pham National Park in Vietnam. 
He did this as an older gentleman. He was an electronics engineer who went there on vacation in 1990. And he saw that a number of baby primates were being confiscated by the government. And they, they were being smuggled into China as pets. And he was like, it wasn't my work, it wasn't my profession, but what am I supposed to do? They were euthanizing all these beautiful baby primates. So he started this rescue center. I went over and we used transfer cages as little mini sets. But the thing I love about Tilo is this. There are so many guns in Vietnam. There's so many hunters in Vietnam that he knows he can never release these animals in his lifetime. But he does it anyway. He keeps nine different species again. This one, there's only 55 of them alive at the time I was there a couple years ago, and he had 13 of them. I mean, that's amazing. He did it anyway. He did it because it was hard. He did it because it was the right thing to do, no matter what the projections are for Vietnam, whether they're going to come through this biological bio bottleneck with any other species left intact or not. He doesn't care. He cares that these animals need help right now, and that's what he's doing, and he'll never live long enough to see these animals released, and that, to me, is awesome. That's awesome. So what do we do with these pictures? Well, we give them away. National Geographic sponsoring the project, and we come along and we... We do the pictures. Wherever we work, we give them to the zoos, the wildlife rehab centers, the private breeders, the aquariums. We give these pictures away so that the pictures can be used for all time to help save animals, right? The I am not a trinket sign that runs everywhere. We, Ellen and I, Ellen, daughter Ellen's here tonight. We saw this at an airport coming up here. Houston Zoo's been a big supporter. They put them on their admission tickets and on the sides of buildings. The pictures were doing it. They did a Times Square takeover last summer which was a nice thing. Geographics come on board fully now, did 10 different covers of the photo art to announce it to the world. And this film, Racing Extinction, done by a, a movie maker named Luisa Hoyos, he asked if he could use some of the pictures and the video I'd shot on a few building projections. I didn't even know what a building projection was. <laughs> so by introducing the, the, the whole notion of biodiversity, most people still don't know what that means, by introducing this to the world steadily like an ad campaign, over years, that's the way that we try to win hearts and minds towards caring about nature, right? It starts with people like daughter Ellen, you know? Her generation, they're confined to computers. Everything they see is on a computer. And yet she knows, still, no, she doesn't get out a whole lot. She knows that you want to drive a Prius rather than a pickup. You want to ride a bike. You should recycle, Absolutely. But true change is generational. It doesn't happen overnight, and that's a shame, because I like to get things done now. Type A. And yet we know that energy efficient everything, it's not just good for the environment, it's good for your wallet. Lower, lower consumption light bulbs all the way up to insulating your homes properly. It gets cold here, right? You are blowing money if you don't have adequate insulation in your attic. Do it. You'll make money doing this stuff. Green is good. Uh, buying and eating locally sourced foods. Why tr pay to have things trucked all the way across the continent? Eat things seasonally. Eat less meat. Meat takes a lot of energy, a lot of chemicals, a lot of water to produce it. And when you buy locally, you know what? It tastes better. It's largely organic. This is a problem. This is a 30 minutes from my house. This is a huge problem. Big monoculture farms, there's not much room to for anything else, is there? That's tough. That's really tough. We pulled out, by the way, we eliminated our lawn and we planted a no-water fescue. And in the corner, we left that so that we could plant milkweed for monarchs. Monarchs really, really do need our help. Pollinating insects in general. Why should we care what happens to the, to the bees and the butterflies? One-third of every bite of food you eat is brought to you thanks to a pollinating insect. That's important. We like to eat. We like the status quo. We want our good lifestyles. Better preserve nature. We ought to. Mandating environmental education in schools is a wonderful thing and really important, especially as kids get farther and farther from the forest, right? Daughter Ellen in her room, she knows that it's about the stuff we buy. She had cleaned her room prior to this picture for me. The stuff we buy, this is the biggest thing of all. You do not have to wait for an election year to vote. The stuff you buy, how do you spend your money? What do you spend it on? Every time you break out your purse or your wallet, you are saying to a retailer, I approve of this. I want you to do it again and again and again, no matter where it's made and what it's made from. Do it again and again and again. That moves mountains. Your dollar moves mountains, right? And the other thing, get out. Get outside. Take kids outside. Let them get muddy. 
Kids love to get muddy. Even Spencer the fit thrower will go fishing with his dad if I bribe him in ice cream enough, right? So I guess to sum it up, I wanted to just mention this, if I could. We've never had a better time to try to save the world thanks to the power of the web. You can get, you can get your feelings known. You can get your good deeds known. You can, you can highlight companies that are doing the right thing. You can bring down bad things, right? This is an excellent time, but do not count on somebody else doing it. You're it. You are it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you.